Okay. David, go ahead. All right. Thanks. Thanks again, Keva. So I'm going to tell you now in, in the remaining uh, half hour about more recent work um, that uh, that uh, deals with trying to understand the dynamics in a system that's known as interface chromatin. If you're not familiar with chromatin, I'll explain what that is in, in just a, a minute. Um, this was uh, this is collaborative work. A lot of the work that I'm going to show was performed by my uh, former uh, PhD student, Achal Mahajan, who's now at MathWorks. And this is also a collaboration with uh, Mike Shelley and Wen Yen at uh, the Flatiron Institute and Alexander Zdowska at, at NYU, who's uh, been doing all the experiments that I'm going to show. Um, so what's chromatin? Just a little bit of background. So here's a, a cartoon of a kind of a generic uh, human cell. Um, which contains a lot of stuff, all these organelles, and what we're really going to be focused on, for, focusing on in this talk is what happens here inside the, the nucleus. And of course, the nucleus is the, the control center of the cell that uh, makes all the decisions because it contains our, our genetic information. And chromatin is really nothing but, well, not just nothing but, but it, it's a fancy word for DNA, right? Uh, so it's essentially the functional form of DNA inside uh, the nucleus. Uh, and so this is more precisely what chromatin looks like inside the cell. So you're all familiar with the, the DNA helix, uh, which encodes our genetic information in the form of the sequence of base pairs. Uh, the DNA helix is not present by itself in the cell. Uh, rather, it's associated with many different types of proteins. Uh, and specifically, it tends to uh, wrap around these sets of proteins that are known as histones to form this kind of uh, beads on a string. Uh, configuration, which then folds hierarchically into higher order structures, all the way up to these mitotic chromosomes that we're familiar with from, uh, from uh, uh, high school biology, which are bio the chromosomes that you observe during cell division. Uh, this is a highly complex uh, process, which is not completely understood. And just to give you a sense of the, the, the complication, we're thinking about packing two meters of genomic DNA uh, in human cells inside a, a nucleus, which is on the order of tens of microns in size. So this is a, a very, very complex process. <clears throat> in between cell divisions, uh, these mitotic chromosomes are not uh, in the shape that I'm showing here, but uh, this is really what you should have in mind. So the, the mitotic chromosomes are not condensed, and the chromatin is really loosely packed inside the nucleus. So you should really think of this as some kind of a, a polymer solutions that's confined inside this, uh, this envelope. Um, there's been a lot of work trying to understand the, the, the spatial arrangement and the structure of chromatin, and so I'm just going to highlight a few uh, experiments that have looked at this. So um, a few years ago, um, these beautiful imaging experiments from colleagues here at UCSD uh, were able to look at the, the structure, the density of, of uh, chromatin across the nucleus, and what you find is that um, it's really uh, very heterogeneous. So you have regions that are very dilute, regions that are very dense. And for comparison, this is the density of mitotic chromosomes here on the bottom right. So you really should be thinking of this disordered polymer chain, which is arranged inside the, 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 the nucleus in a very heterogeneous fashion. Um, other techniques that have been used to try to describe the organization of chromatin uh, include high-C maps, which is a technique that allows you to measure the probability of contact between two loci, so two locations along the chromatin. And uh, so you can do, actually do this experimentally, and, and this reveals a lot of interesting features, which I'm going to briefly summarize here. Uh, depending on the length scale uh, where you look, uh, you have these uh, different types of features that are observed. So let me explain first what these maps show. So you, you have, let's say, one chromosome on the vertical axis, another chromosome on the horizontal axis, and the color shows you the, the frequency of contact between two uh, locations along these chromosomes. So obviously, you have a, a, a a uh, high probability of contact along the diagonal because you're more likely to interact with yourself or your neighbors than you are with other chromosomes that are further apart. On uh, short scales, uh, people have uh, noticed that you have features that are known as TADs here, which are topologically associated domains, which are characterized by these uh, kind of square patterns with these uh, peaks of the diagonal. And these are thought to be associated with the formation of loops along the chromatin, which are uh, which are created by uh, proteins known as loop extruding factors. If you zoom out, uh, then you end up seeing compartments, which uh, are uh, uh, highlighted by these plat patterns in these high C maps. And these correspond to, again, pieces of chromatin that tend to frequently interact with themselves or with neighbors. And finally, you zoom out and you find what are known as chromosome territories, which correspond to individual chromosomes. So each chromosome occupies a specific uh, region of the, of the nucleus. <clears throat> 
so there's, as you can see, this is a very um, complex problem, uh, but a lot of the work that's been done until now has looked at this from a static point of view, right? This just tells you if you take a snapshot, uh, how is the chromatin organized? As it turns out, chromatin is not uh, static inside the nucleus and it's highly dynamic. And this is really what I'm going to focus on in, in this talk. Um, so this is an experiment by my collaborator, Alexander Zudowska, who uh, is at NYU, as I mentioned. And um, she developed this technique uh, known as displacement correlation spectroscopy that allows us that allows her to visualize the entire cell nucleus of live uh, of live cells, uh, which is what you're looking at here. So this is a nucleus of a HeLa cell, and uh, the green uh, fluorescent signal that you're looking at is the is the chromatin that's been tagged. Uh, the histone specifically uh, can can be made to fluoresce. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, it's about 15 microns across. And uh, if you look at this movie, you see that there's a lot of motion. Uh, some of it, of course, is uh, Brownian motion, given the scale. But if you squint a little bit, uh, you might be able to tell that you also have some coherent motions that are taking place. It's kind of hard to see in this movie, but the, really the best way to see this is to do some analysis on these images. Uh, you can do essentially something similar to particle image well symmetry, which is that you take two images and you cross-correlate to determine a displacement map. And this is what uh, these maps look like. Oops. Uh, so I'm showing two uh, cells here. The, the top row is a wild type cell, and the bottom row is an ATP depleted cell. And what you're looking at here are displacement vectors over a certain time scale delta t, and they're color coded according to their direction. So let's focus on the top row. Uh, what uh, hopefully uh, jumps at you is that you have these large regions, for example, right here in the middle that uh, have a single color, this is kind of bluish purple. And that means that this whole region is moving coherently in the same direction. And in fact, you can see that all the vectors are pointing to the bottom left. And so you have these large coherent motions uh, that occupy regions on the orders of sizes of microns that, dur that uh, have durations of multiple seconds that are observed in these, in these experiments. If you do the same experiment on an ATP depleted cell, these coherent motions essentially disappear and you start seeing much more uh, uncorrelated and random uh, motions, which are more typical of Brownian noise. So this tells us that uh, clearly there's some active processes that are happening inside the cell. And this is what we'd like to understand. Uh, how do these active processes conspire to, uh, to give rise to these large scale motions? So you can be a little bit more quantitative. You can calculate it's an autocorrelation function of the displacement maps. And uh, consistent with the, the results from the previous slide, you find that it decays fairly slowly uh, in the wild type cells, but much more rapidly in the ATP depleted cells. Uh, so there are coherent motions, and we'd like to come up with a, a basic model that perhaps uh, can help us understand where these come from. And so our, our hypothesis is that these are caused by active enzymes, uh, such as RNA polymerase, tocoid isomerase, helicase, et cetera, et cetera, that exert stresses on the system as they perform their functions and somehow cooperate to drive to give rise to large scale flows. So what's going on inside the, the, the nucleus, a lot of stuff, and I don't pretend to be an expert in any of this, but uh, I hope that you're all familiar with uh, um, RNA polymerization. This should not be transcription. This should be polymerization um, in which RNA polymerase uh, walks along the DNA chain, unzips it, uh, 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 then copies it into an RNA segment, and then rezips it. And this involves active stresses, clearly. There's also replication that takes place, and then you also have proteins that are known as chromatin remodelers that essentially uh, act to condense and decondense fragments of chromatin. So all of this is extremely complicated, but this clearly involves ATP and uh, internal generation of stresses. And so this is going to be the premise for our model. So here's the first model that we came up with, and I'll show you a slightly more uh, sophisticated model later on. So we're going to simulate a long, flexible polymer that's contained inside a spherical cavity, as you can see here on the right. So this is a single chain. Um, and that chain is, uh, in this first version of the model, a bead rod chain. So we're going to think about, think about rigid links that are connected by uh, freely jointed beads. And this is really a coarse grain model. So you should think of each uh, link in this chain as being some or some piece of chromatin with all its associated proteins and enzymes and so on. And we're going to uh, coarse grain or idealize the effect of these uh, active enzymes in terms, again, of force dipoles. And the, the rationale for this is that if you take a piece of chromatin like this one, um, other than the tensions in the chain, there's no net external force acting on it. And therefore, 
uh, for conservation momentum, the net stresses exerted by these active enzymes to leading order amount to a dipole. So stochastically, we're going to apply a force dipole on one link in the chain, and these dipoles are also going to be transmitted to the viscous nucleoplasm that the chain is, is, uh, is floating in. So we're gonna be solving uh, Langevin dynamics, uh, where we have a velocity of a bead, which uh, is advected by whatever flow there might be in the nucleoplasm, and I'll explain how I calculate this in just a second. We have uh, tensions inside the chain, which are essentially Lagrange multipliers to ensure an extensibility of the links, uh, Bryan forces, and excluded volume forces. So just a few more details on these. So we, we calculate the Bryan forces to satisfy the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Um, excluded volume is just achieved using a, a soft repulsive potential. Uh, we have an algorithm to calculate the tensions as Lagrange multipliers, and then really the, the one ingredient that's new is these active forces. So stochastically, with on and off rates, k on and p off, we're going to apply a dipole, which could be either extensile or contractile, and that dipole is uh, transmitted to the fluid. If we know the forces in the system, we can calculate the flow. This is uh, Stokes' flow inside a spherical cavity. There's actually an exact expression for the Green's function g, which we can use to calculate the flow field analytically or numerically, but based on analytical formulas. So we can simulate this. Um, there are a lot of parameters in the, in the problem, many of which we don't really have a good handle on. I'm primarily going to be focusing on two of them and, and the following slides. One is this dipole strength, which here has been made dimensionless by KBT. Uh, so this is a measure of activity. And then I told you that these dipoles are stochastic with on and off rates. So there's a probability PA that any link is active at a point in time, uh, which is dependent on these on and off rates. And the product of these quantities, as we'll C is actually a, a relevant quantity, which I'm going to call A, which is an activity parameter. You can think of this as a dipole strength that's been corrected for the stochasticity of the, of the dipoles. So let's look at some results. Um, so we're going to simulate these equations uh, inside a sphere, and I'm going to uh, first look at the passive case. Um, so initially, there's a short transient where the chain relaxes to fill the entire space, and then it just diffuses. So there's just Brownian motion. Uh, the chain jiggles around, but there's no you don't really notice any large scale motions or any large reorganizations, at least in the time scale of these simulations. So this is very similar to just an entangled polymer solution, except that here we just have one very long chain. Now let's look at uh, the contract dot case. So if we exert contract dot dipoles, um, what you might be able to see is that you have stronger fluctuations, you have more motion than in the, in the Brownian case. And this is not surprising because these dipoles create flows that move the chain around. Uh, but these motions appear to be largely local and uncorrelated. You don't really see any large uh, reconfiguration of the system. Now let's look at uh, the case of an extensile uh, system where we're now uh, putting extensile dipoles along the chain. And here the dynamics looks very different. Uh, so this is kind of an extreme case. We have very strong activity, but very quickly you see that you get large scale motions on this whole scale of the nucleus with these large scale uh, rotations and reorganization of the system. And this is also accompanied, as you might be able to tell, by uh, stretching and alignment of the chain, especially near the boundaries. So this is something that I'll come back to in a few minutes. So this is what our model predicts, our simple model. And you can, again, calculate displacement maps very much like in the experiments. And these are uncorrelated in the passive case. In the contractile case, you start seeing some regions of correlated motions, but they're fairly small. And the extensile case, the size of the coherent regions reaches the, the size of the nucleus. And this is, again, uh, confirmed by these autocorrelation functions here on the right. Um, you can quantify this a little bit more. For example, the, the, the transition to this uh, coherent motion, we, the way one measure that we found to quantify it is to look at the growth of the pneumatic uh, order parameter in the system, uh, which uh, grows and saturates in systems where you do see productive motion. And by uh, extracting the slope of these curves, you can uh, determine when the transition to coherent motion takes place. So here I'm showing the slope beta as a function of A, which is this activity parameter that I defined earlier. And you find that beta becomes positive above a, a critical value of A. So there's a critical level of activity that you need to exceed in order uh, to start seeing these collective motions. You can actually come up with a phase diagram, as I'm showing here. So here I'm showing a phase diagram in the space of uh, PA, which is, again, the probability of uh, having an active link so that when you move along the x-axis, you have more dipoles. And on the vertical axis is dipole strength. So when you move up, you have stronger dipoles. Uh, 
And so either increasing the number of dipoles or the strength of the, the dipoles gives rise to a transition from this uh, incoherent uh, state where you don't really see any large scale motions to a state where you have large scale motions and nomadic alignment of the chain that, that emerges. Um, in the next uh, few minutes, I just want to tell you about a, an improved version of the model that, uh, that is more recent, uh, in which we've been trying to uh, add some realism, I guess, to the model. And in particular, one thing that we've been interested in, in understanding is the, the dynamics of phase separation or phase segregation of chromatin. This is something that I haven't mentioned yet. There are actually two types of chromatin, which are known as heterochromatin and euchromatin. Um, euchromatin corresponds to, uh, and this is, I should say, in differentiated cells. Um, euchromatin corresponds to active genes. So these are the genes that the cell actively needs to access in, for, for uh, uh, transcription. And so euchromatin is typically loosely packed because the uh, DNA polymerase needs to be ex accessing genes. Heterochromatin, on the other hand, is, uh, corresponds to the genes that are transcriptionally silent, that the, the cell does not need to access. And so these genes are typically compacted. And so, compacted, and so heterochromatin has a, has a much higher density. And um, if you look at uh, the nuclei of, of various uh, cells, this is what it looks like. Um, I think the color code here is, is incorrect. So the green in these pictures corresponds to the euchromatin and the red to the heterochromatin. And so you find that the, the heterochromatin in many cells tends to, uh, tends to condense around the boundary, although you also have some inside uh, the cell, for example, here, uh, it also tends to condense around nucleoli, which are organelles that are present inside the cells. And in some types of cells, uh, you actually find what's known as an inverted nucleus where the, uh, where the uh, heterochromatin concentrates at the center. So it kind of depends on the type of cell that you're looking at. Um, and that's something that I'll come back to. There's been a number of models that have tried to, uh, to uh, look at this phase separation. And I'm showing a couple of them here on the left. For example, in this work by the group of Spakovitz, uh, they did also Brannon Dynamics, Monte Carlo simulations of long polymers, uh, which were heteropolymers, where they had two types of monomers that had different affinities. And they found that indeed they get, they get uh, uh, condensation of uh, heterochromatin, in this case, in the center of the nucleus. So we'd like to look at this problem and in particular uh, investigate what the effects of activity are on the dynamics of this, of this phase segregation. So here's our, our uh, version two of our uh, chromatin model. So it's gonna be slightly more uh, realistic. We're not going to be simulating an ellipsoidal nucleus, which is closer to the actual shape of the nucleus in most cells. Uh, we have multiple chains in the simulations I'm gonna show you, we're gonna have 23 chromosomes. And now these chains are um, are uh, block copolymers. Specifically, each chain is going to be um, um, is going to be divided into segments of uh, euchromatin and segments of heterochromatin. Euchromatin is going to be active, so this this is where we're going to be applying uh, force dipoles, very much like in the first version of the model. And heterochromatin, the blue segments here, is going to be passive, meaning that there is no force dipoles that are exerted there. And heterochromatin can crosslink with itself, either interchain or interchain. So we have stochastic crosslinks that can form when two beads get close to one another. Um, another uh, modification to the model is that this is now going to be a bead spring uh, chain as opposed to a bead rod, which uh, bead spring is likely more uh, appropriate for describing something which, like chromatin, which is soft. So let me show you some results. So I'm going to show you a couple of movies here. Um, the, the top row is a passive chain in which I only have Brian fluctuations, but the crosslinks can still, take, uh, can still occur. And the bottom row is uh, an active chain in which along the euchromatin segments, I, I again have stochastic force dipoles that can drive flows inside the nucleus. Uh, the first row is gonna be the full system. The second row, you're gonna still see the whole chain, but you're also going to see cross links that appear, which are going to be represented as gray beads. The third row you'll see is going to show you the uh, boundary of heterochromatic regions, which are regions where the cross link density uh, exceeds a certain threshold. And then on the right, I'm only going to show four chains so that you, you can see a little bit uh, what's happening inside. So let's look at it. Um, so in the passive system, uh, what you uh, might be able to see is that there's not very much reorganization of the chromosomes. They're pretty much staying where they are. And you, of course, have fluctuations. Uh, Crosslinks are forming. These are the gray beads in the second column, and they're pretty much forming uniformly across the entire nucleus, 
as you can see here, this is the boundary of this uh, heterochromatic regions where the crosslinks are, are dense and it pretty much fills the entire nucleus. Finally, the four chains on the right don't really rearrange very much other than uh, because of the action of these crosslinks. The bottom uh, row shows the case where we have extensile activity along the euchromatin uh, segments. Um, and uh, what you can see right away is that there's a lot more mixing, a lot more uh, rearrangements taking place in the distribution of the chromosomes. Um, and the other feature that you uh, hopefully can notice is that the heterochromatin is a lot denser. It's a lot denser and it tends to condense towards the center of the nucleus. And here you can see again that the, these chains are getting reorganized a lot more as a result of these flows uh, induced by extensile activity. So just to summarize, in both cases we have formation of heterochromatin, but the compaction and segregation of heterochromatin is much stronger in the case where we have these uh, extensile flows. So we can quantify this uh, in various ways. So um, I'm, I'm going to be fairly brief as I'm almost out of time. Uh, but we've, for example, looked at the, the uh, variance of the, of the mass distribution of both types of chromatin. And we find that the heterochromatin here denoted by the full lines tends to migrate towards the center of the nucleus when that's not the case with the euchromatin. We also looked at the density of heterochromatin as a function of time. Uh, which increases with activity. That's the red curve, which has the highest level of activity. And we find that this increase of activity is due to both an increase in the number of beads that are getting entrapped inside these uh, dense regions and a decrease in the volume. In other words, you have denser uh, regions that also contain more beads. And here's just a snapshot of, of some density fields across uh, a cross section of the nucleus, where we find indeed that we have a concentration of heterochromatin in the center uh, in the case where we have extensile activity. Um, the origin of this is all in the stresses. So we can actually calculate stresses, calculate uh, pneumatic fields. And what we find is that there is strong pneumatic alignment inside euchromatin, at least at high levels of activity. Uh, and this, um, as I said, this alignment is primarily observed inside, inside euchromatin. And here are maps here on the right of the uh, Q tensors of the pneumatic field. Again, in the cross section, we have strong pneumatic alignment in the euchromatic regions, which are located primarily in the periphery of the nucleus. Uh, finally, the bottom plot shows you some flow fields. Uh, so you can calculate the flow field induced by uh, heterochromatin, which is the first panel here, the flow field induced by uh, the stresses on the heterochromatin, and then the total flow field is the sum of the two. And uh, what you find is that there's a much stronger flow, of course, exerted by euchromatin, which is where the dipolar activity takes place. And one interesting feature is that if you, if you zoom in, for example, in these red panels, you find that the flow fields induced by heterochromatin and induced by, heter by euchromatin tend to oppose each other. And uh, the origin of this is uh, hydrodynamic screening. Essentially, the heterochromatin, which is this dense cross-linked network, screens the flow fields that are induced uh, by euchromatin, uh, by, by the dipole activity along euchromatin. Okay, the last thing I'm going to show is some consequences of this for uh, contact maps. Uh, so here are some contact maps that we, cal we calculated from our simulations. Uh, the first panel is for a passive chain, Brownian. The second panel is for an active extensile chain uh, in which we have this uh, dipolar activity. And they look quite different. You find that the um, uh, you have much more features uh, in the case of the ex active, active extensile activity in particular, you have these plant patterns that are observed in, in experiments, um, which uh, are not as clearly visible in the passive case where you have a much more uniform distribution of, uh, of chromatin. Um, another feature that we're able to observe in our simulations, which, uh, which um, you might have seen in the movies earlier, is that we have the formation of loops that are created by the flow fields that tend to stretch the chromatin out. And these loops have signatures, again, that we can identify along, these, uh, along the diagonal of these high C maps. OK, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, to summarize. So we've developed a, a minimal coarse grain model of chromatin that accounts for enzymatic activity, hydrogenic interactions, as well as cross-linking in the newer version of the model. One prediction is that in extensile systems, uh, Nucleoplasmic flows can drive coherent motions that uh, are consistent qualitatively with experimental observations in uh, live cells. And the, the mechanism for this is a little bit similar to the mechanism for the collective motion that we see in active pneumatics or bacterial suspensions, which again has to do with the alignment of these force dipoles uh, under, the under, under the flow fields that they, that they generate. Uh, 
uh, in our uh, dye block polymer model, we showed that activity has the effect of enhancing the compaction and segregation of heterochromatin. And finally, I just want to highlight that there are many questions that remain open. Our model is very simplistic, and so there's, there's many parameters that we don't really know how to estimate yet. Uh, there might be other interactions, of course, uh, that we're not uh, accounting here, in particular the formation of loops, uh, which is known to take place inside the cell nucleus. And then we can ask ourselves about the, the relevance of these motions. Um, obviously, they induce uh, stirring and chaotic advection, and so this could be uh, useful for transport inside the nucleus, and there might be some implications also for, uh, for genetics or chromatin remodeling. So with this, let me uh, thank my collaborators. As I mentioned, a lot of the work, especially on the second version of the model, was do done by Atchal, who was a, a PhD student in my group, and he's now working at MathWorks. Um, Alexandra Zdowska is our chromatin expert, and she's been doing all the experiments, and then some of the modeling was done in collaboration with Mike Shelley and Wen Yen. Uh, we have a, a publication on the first version of the model, as well as a publication on uh, the dynamics of isolated chains. And then we have a preprint, uh, which you can actually find on the bioarchive uh, on the second version of the model. Uh, with this, um, thank you. And I'd like to take, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat> uh, thank you, David. I always learn new things um, when listening to your talks. Uh, we have quite a few questions. We'll ask them quickly from Sriram. Uh, is this a slice or a projection, I guess, uh, for uh, some of the movies in the beginning, in the figures? Um, I'm not sure which movie you were referring to. Um, I'm guessing it's... Uh, oh, yeah, pictures from uh, Alexandra Zidovska's measurements. Alexandra, okay, so that's a good... That, that's funny because someone else asked me the exact same question yesterday. Um, I don't know for sure, to be honest. So I don't want to. I don't want to. I see. Alexandra. Okay. I suspect it's a slice, though. I'm, I don't know exactly what the what the thickness is. So I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, from uh, Jessica Zhao, uh, have you mapped uh, strain map from displacement map? Do you see any correlation of chromatin density and strain? Oh, that's a very interesting idea. So. Um, so not specifically, to be honest. Uh, though one thing that I didn't mention. Uh, in the second part of the talk is that there's some interesting rheology, I guess, um, that uh, that uh, that can be measured actually in, in, in these experiments. And that Alexandra has a, a recent paper where she did essentially microrheology on the nucleus. Um, and she finds that inside heterochromatin, the behavior is very much like a, a solid, like a Maxwell solid, a new chromatin, it's more like an active fluid. Uh, so there's definitely some, uh, some interesting Rheological or mechanical measurements that you can that can, you can infer from the displacement maps. Yes. So there's definitely some some interesting modeling that could be done there as well, but we haven't really uh, gone into that uh, direction yet. Uh, from Ricard Alert, uh, why are flows in the contractile case so different from those in the extensile case? Is it because of the asymmetric response of the chain to extension versus compression? And Sriram uh, answered this. Maybe. Right. So I guess so. This is a possibly little... wrong way. <laughs> uh, no, I think Sirman, you, you you got it right. I mean, this is related to the first to my first uh, talk, I guess. Right. The, the rheology. Another way to think about it is the 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 even though each the dipoles have the exact same symmetry, just different sign. Right. They, their effect on the alignment of the chain is opposite. So the the extensile dipoles tend to align, whereas the contractile dipoles don't like to align. And so that's why you get these large scale flows that emerge when a lot of these dipoles align in the extensile case. Uh, whereas in the contractile case, it kind of tend to randomize things. And so you don't really see anything on, on large line scales. So this is very similar to the uh, instabilities in of active pneumatics that uh, many of you are familiar with. Yeah, OK, makes sense. Thanks. Uh, from uh, Nancy Ford, uh, your block copolymer assignment is fixed for each chain, and then you vary the activity level of the active segments. Have you looked into how much of the length of the block segments affects the ordering? Presumably, right. there must be a minimum length. That's that's right. So we, we haven't looked at that precisely, but I think that's a very interesting question. The, all the simulations I showed you, each chain had four blocks of each, I guess, that were of, of a constant length and alternating uh, periodically. Uh, of course, that's not what's happening in the in, in the cell, right? Uh, so uh, it would be interesting to see how the distribution of the of the heterochromatin uh, affects the 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 structure that we see eventually. These simulations are pretty costly, I should say. One of these simulations, the long ones, can take several weeks uh, to run. So we, we unfortunately can't afford to run many different uh, combinations of parameters. But that's something that would be very interesting to look at. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, and one more question from Jilin. Uh, is the cross link in the model necessary for the segregation of heterochromatin from the euchromatin? That's also a very interesting question. So that's something that we, that we thought about. Um, we, we thought that, well, maybe even without crosslinks, just the fact that we have these two types of, of chromatin, they might face separate spontaneously because of activity or something like that. Uh, we tried to look at this a little bit, and we didn't really see any uh, significant segregation if we did not include the, the crosslinks. Um, though I think there's other groups that have looked at uh, other models of, of uh, heterochromatin using effective temperatures where you, they have observed some, uh, some phase separation. So that's, that's another interesting direction I think that we should explore further. Um, so in the interest of time, we will stop here but, uh, and we'll stop the recording, but David will stay afterwards for a few minutes for anyone who wants to discuss informally. So thank you, David, again, for the wonderful talk and tutorial. Thank you, it was a pleasure.